In earlier classes and discussions, we've talked about how metals and nonmetals form ionic bonds and nonmetals form covalent bonds. All of that is not necessarily as cut and dried as we've made it seem up to this point. There's this idea that we call electronegativity. And electronegativity is just a number that indicates in a, in a bond, in any sort of bond, how tightly does a nucleus want to hold on to the electrons that it is sharing or giving or taking. The electronegativity of the elements is treated as a constant. It's been tested and measured lots and lots of times. And you can find tables that look like this that have electronegativity values. You can find um, more traditional tables, just like element name, electronegativity. All of that is um, readily available pretty much on the internet and in your textbook. <clears throat> the chart that I have shown here is a little more detailed than many of the charts. So you'll notice a lot of the, the representative elements and a handful of the transition elements have their electronegativities reported to two decimal places. That's usually a lot more specific than you're actually going to use. Um, for our purposes, you can round those to the nearest tenth and you'll be fine. Now, the scale of the electronegativities starts at francium. Francium is the least electronegative of any of the elements. Francium really doesn't care about extra electrons. It doesn't want the electrons that it has, basically. And so francium has an electronegativity of 0 0.7. If it can bond with something, it's going to give away an electron. On the opposite end, we have fluorine. And fluorine has an electronegativity of about four. That's the top limit for our electronegativity scale. If there is an electron that fluorine might be able to grab a hold of, it will. Fluorine is the greediest of the elements. It will hold its electrons very closely to itself and it'll steal electrons whenever it's possible. Now, when I said that we've talked about covalent and ionic bonds, we've been discussing them as though they were completely separate things. Electrons are either shared or transferred. That's it. That's not actually the truth. What really happens is more of a spectrum where on one end, which would be an electronegativity difference of zero, you've got a totally nonpolar covalent bond. This would be if you had something like a carbon-carbon bond for example. So you've got two atoms, they have the exact same electronegativity, they are going to share the electrons in that bond perfectly equally. So the two electrons in that bond will spend half of their time on one carbon and half of their time on the other carbon. Remember how we talked about electrons existing in those probability clouds that were called orbitals. When two atoms bond, their orbitals overlap and sort of smush together. And so the electrons in the bond now can occupy this orbital that encompasses both of the nuclei. On the opposite end of our bonding spectrum would be I guess an electronegativity difference of 3.3, .3, which would be if we had a francium and fluorine bond. That would be completely ionic. There would be no, the, the electron involved in the bond would spend all of its time on fluorine and none of its time on francium. 
Now, along this spectrum, we can designate some, some sort of breakpoints. And the way that we do that is by finding the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms on either end of a bond. We only deal with electronegativity differences for an individual bond. So if we have a compound that's got six bonds in it, we're going to have to find the electronegativity difference six times. Now, if the difference is less than 0.4, we'll say less than or equal to 0.4, so if it's less than 0.5, then we say that that bond is nonpolar, purely covalent, the electron spends half its time at each end of the bond. On the, the upper end, this graph that I have found that I'm showing you now marks the breakpoint around 1.8. That one is a little bit fuzzy. I generally use 2. 2.0. So if the electronegativity difference is greater than 2, I say it's an ionic bond. <clears throat> The reason that that gets a little bit tricky is there are some metal-nonmetal -metal pairs that definitely form ionic bonds because it's a metal and a nonmetal, but their electronegativity difference is lower than, say, the difference between hydrogen and fluorine. And that is a little gray area. Now, Everything in between 0.4 and 2-ish we consider to be a polar covalent bond. So that means that our electrons are spending more time on the more electronegative element, atom, than on the less electronegative atom. Let me show you a diagram that hopefully will clear that up a little bit. On the left here, we have a purely nonpolar covalent bond. In this example, it's two chlorine atoms. They each have the exact same electronegativity, and so the electrons are very evenly distributed. And that's why the electron cloud, if you will, is fairly uniform across the whole thing. At the right end, we have a sodium chloride compound. And so our sodium atom has completely given up its electron, its one valence electron. The chlorine has completely taken that in. The purple indicates that that is a full positive charge on the sodium. And now our chlorine has a full negative charge. In the middle, we have HCl. Now, Hydrogen and chlorine have a large enough electronegativity difference that the chlorine is definitely going to hold on to those bonding electrons more strongly than hydrogen will. But it's not high enough that there's going to be a full transfer. So the electrons in that bond might spend 80% of their time on chlorine and 20% of their time on hydrogen compared to the two opposite ends of the spectrum, right, we have a 50-50 split and essentially a 0-100 split. So anything in between there is going to be a polar covalent bond. Now, I do want to point out that the more electronegative element, atom, is always going to have a partial negative charge and the less electronegative atom will have a partial positive charge. The little symbols that you see on either end of this polar covalent bond, those are lowercase deltas. So they're just a Greek letter. And that little squiggly thing means that it is a partial charge. So if it were a full positive or negative charge, we would just use the plus or the minus like we have in the ionic bond. But since it's not a full charge, it's a partial charge, we use that delta. Now, 
what's going to be much more important as we move into chapter 11 is this idea of a dipole moment. The dipole moment is basically those partial positive and negative charges that we talked about on the last slide. And so the, the compounds that I have displayed here are hydrogen bonded to the halogens. Hydrogen fluoride is on the left, hydrogen iodide is on the right. Because the electronegativity of the halogens drops as we move down the period, the group, you can see that HF is much darker red around the fluorine end, and HI is really sort of a yellow green around the iodine end. That is because the red in these maps represents higher electron density. So in HF, for example, the blue down there by the hydrogen means that it doesn't get the electrons much at all. The dark red by the fluorine tells us that that's where the electrons are hanging out. As we move into HCl, we see there's still some blue, but it's not as much, it's not as strong. And so the hydrogen is going to get those bonded electrons more than the hydrogen in HF. But still, the chlorine is going to keep most of the electron density. And then as we move to HBr, that gets a little more exaggerated. And by the time we get to hydrogen iodide, it's getting to be a fairly even distribution. Um, the size of the clouds that are mapped out here is increasing because the halogens are increasing in size and not because of anything to do with the bonded electrons. We could, for each of these maps, I'll use, I'll do HF. No, I'll do HCl as our example. We can assign those same partial charges that we used in the previous slide. And so our hydrogen here is going to have oh, a partial positive charge and our chlorine end will have a partial negative charge. Okay. The other way that we can demonstrate where these charges are sitting is a little bit different. We can draw arrows and the arrows are going to have very specific qualities to them. They're going to have a direction and they're going to have a length. So the way that we draw our arrows, we always point towards the more electronegative element. And at the end where we've got the less electronegative element, we cross the arrow to make sort of a plus sign. Now, the direction tells us where the negative part is and where the positive part is. The other thing that is super useful about using these arrows is that we can change the length of the arrow to indicate how strong our charge separation is. And if we were to do that, then we might have for our HI, oh, sorry, we might have a very short arrow because it's a little bit polar, but not really much. The HBR would have a slightly longer arrow. The, the charge separation is a little bit stronger the partial positive and negative charges are larger than any partial charges in the case of HI. HCl would have an arrow that is still a little bit longer. And then HF would have the longest arrow. The length and direction that our arrows are pointing is going to come into play in chapter 11 when we start looking at 
molecules as a complete unit. So far, we're only dealing with individual bonds. But eventually, we're going to start adding these dipole moments together in sort of three-dimensional space. And that's going to tell us whether or not the molecule itself is polar. That directly impacts how it interacts with other molecules. And that key, how molecules interact with other molecules, controls almost every property of matter ever. It's really cool. So keep in mind using the arrows as dipole moments. Um, if you want to do a little research before we get to the molecules, um, we're treating these dipoles essentially as vectors. And a vector is, you use them a lot in physics, it's a number that has a direction and a magnitude. So it has a length and it points in a given direction. Um, and so if you wanted to look up some information on vectors, that would be awesome.